Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. So good to have you with us in our study of the book of Titus. We'll be looking at Titus chapter 1 and verse 4, among other passages. And, uh, you know, if you're looking in on a letter that's written to a particular person, it is important that you know who this person is and who the writer is and what uh, are the matters that are swirling around and that accompany this letter. And uh, so we've looked at Paul, and now we're going to look a little bit more at Titus. And in chapter 4, it says, To Titus, Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. I suppose it's fair to ask who in the world is Titus. Um, for the first half of my Christian life, most of what I knew about the Bible and some of the people who uh, worked with the Apostle Paul was mostly about Timothy. But now there is Titus. And uh, perhaps in the last part of my Christian ministry, I gained more insight into who Titus was. And then after a while, I began to see that Titus, along with Timothy, was one of Paul's right-hand men. And I began to see, as I got the Bible more and more into my brain, uh, that uh, Titus and Timothy were both right-hand men to Paul, and they were different personalities, and that was kind of interesting to me. And uh, so we're going to look at Titus, and uh, it says Titus is, my in my outline, Titus is Paul's ace, or right-hand man. This is not to denigrate Timothy. He was also one of Paul's aces and right-hand men. And uh, he used Titus in some pretty difficult situations. Not every person is suited for this sort of thing. Um, there are men who can go into a troubled church and they can work through the problems and encourage people and get them to forgive and forget, so to speak, or work through some doctrinal issues and teach very kindly, but also forthrightly. And uh, so, you know, God's people, they are constantly attacked by the enemy, and he can get to people who think they're doing the right thing, which actually are doing things that kind of tear up the church. And so you need somebody who uh, can go in and do this sort of thing. And Titus was one of these people. And he sent in Titus to uh, walk into a very difficult situation at the Corinthian church. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 13, uh, things were really in a boil in that church. And he had sent Titus there with a letter. <clears throat> and when you send somebody with a letter, there are many times more than just the mailman. And Titus was the mailman, but he also had this letter backing him up in some of the things he was saying. And perhaps he was explaining things along the way as well. And he had to perceive and kind of work through the issues with the people at Corinth, talk to them, do some counseling, figure out how they were handling things, if they were going to correct things. And it says here in Second Corinthians chapter 2, Now when I came to Troas for the gospel of Christ, and when a door was opened for me in the Lord, I had no rest for my spirit, not finding Titus my brother, but taking my leave of them, I went on to Macedonia. So Paul was greatly concerned about this particular church, Corinth, the Corinthians, and he'd sent Titus down there, and Titus wasn't back yet. And uh, he, he had a door that was open to him, but, I mean, he was uh, 
what do you call, fretting over this in some ways, not, I think, in a sinful fashion, but he had a lot of concerns. And uh, then we see later on in this letter, which was written uh, after Titus got back, but 2 Corinthians chapter 7, and starting with verse 6, it says, well, I'll start with verse 5. For even when we came to Macedonia, now he had been at Troas, but he couldn't get rest about things, so we went on to Macedonia. And for when we came to Macedonia, our flesh had no rest, but we were all were afflicted on every side, conflicts without, fears within, but God who comforts the depressed comforted us by the coming of Titus. Yay, Titus got there. And uh, so then it says, and not only by his coming, but also by the comfort with which he was comforted in you. Titus was received well. He was treated well. Uh, they talked to him. And his ministry evidently was productive. And it says, as he reported to us your longing, your mourning, your zeal for me, so that I rejoiced even more. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, now this is called this is known as the severe letter, and we don't have that in Scripture. Uh, we have First and Second Corinthians, but actually there was a third letter to the Corinthians, uh, but it was lost. Uh, it was this severe letter. For though I caused you sorrow by my letter, I do not regret it, though I did regret it. For I see that that letter caused you sorrow, though only for a while. I now rejoice not that you were made sorrowful, but that you were made sorrowful to the point of repentance. For you were made sorrowful according to the will of God, so that you might not suffer loss in anything through us. For the sorrow that is according to the will of God produces a repentance without regret, leading to salvation. But the sorrow of the world produces faith. For behold, what earnestness this very thing, this godly sorrow has produced in you, what vindication of yourself and what indignation, what fear, what longing, what zeal, what avenging of wrong, in everything you demonstrated yourselves to be innocent in the matter. So you think, well, what in the world were all the problems? All oh, they had all kinds of problems. I think God allowed this church to be the way it was so that these letters would be written and we would have to see how Paul and Titus and others uh, handled these issues and work through them. Otherwise, you'd get the impression that churches don't have everything, any problems. Everything just goes wonderfully. People are just so blessed, and they don't cause any stir, and the devil doesn't cause them any trouble. Well, that's a lie. And uh, so <clears throat> churches some have their difficulties, and it's rare that a church doesn't step up the plate and have to take a couple swats at some pretty big problems. And Titus was the man that Paul sent in to deal with all this. So Titus was a good man. Titus was, you know, a unique man. Then uh, Titus, Titus earlier than 2 Corinthians, uh, was the test case when he went to Jerusalem to find out <clears throat> if it was just the gospel by faith or you had to be circumcised before you could be a Christian. He knew the answer, but he brought Titus, a Gentile Christian. And uh, so he begins to talk about that in Galatians chapter 2. We're looking at some years before this letter in Corinthians was written. Then after an interval of 14 years, I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along also. Titus is a Gentile Christian. 
It was because of a revelation that I went up, and I submitted to them the gospel which I preached among the Gentiles, but I did so in private to those who were of reputation, for fear that I might be running or had run in vain. He says, well, I, I might have made a mistake, but so I did it privately. But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. Well, how did they know that he was Greek? How did they know that he was uncircumcised? Well, he might have had an accident, accent, might have been how he dressed, um, but it also was because they went and spied him out. But it was because of the false brethren secretly brought in who had sneaked in to spy out our liberty, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to bring us into bondage. They actually tried to peer into where Titus, this is my take on it, was. And when Titus was changing his clothes or something, they saw he wasn't circumcised. So this is the extent to which they were going. And verse 5, But we did not yield in subjection to them for even an hour, so that the truth of the gospel would remain with you. And uh, so uh, here was Titus. He was along with Paul and Barnabas. And uh, he was a Gentile Christian, exhibit A, if you will, of a person who could be born again and not have to be Jewish. And they snuck in and spied out his liberty of whether he was circumcised or not. And, uh, you know, as a young man, you kind of remember things like that. And uh, here was Titus, and he was the test case. And they did not require Titus uh, to be circumcised. So uh, that kind of broke the bone and showed that you could be a Christian and it didn't matter whether you were circumcised or not. That had nothing to do with it. Because those who were circumcised before as Jewish, they weren't saved. They had to have faith in Jesus Christ. And those who were Gentiles, they had faith in Jesus Christ and it had nothing to do with whether they were circumcised or not, but by faith. And uh, so uh, the man who handled the, uh, was sent into Corinth to deal with those problems, was the test case at the Jerusalem Council, and the man that was sent over to Crete to deal with uh, the rebellious people. Here in chapter 1 of Titus, looking at verse 10, uh, Paul is sending him in to talk to these people on that island. He says, For there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision. Well, that's right up Titus Alley. He was exhibit A at the Jerusalem Council. He had his liberty spied out. They did not make him become circumcised. He could stand up and give his testimony, and it was a whopper right at ground zero. And he was going in there to rebuke these men who were Judaizers, trying to make the Gentile believers become Jewish, otherwise they couldn't get saved. Well, that's a false gospel, you see. And it says here in verse 11, who must be silenced? because they were upsetting whole families, teaching things they should not teach for the sake of sordid gain. One of themselves, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. For this reason, reprove them severely so that they may be sound in the faith, not paying attention to Jewish myths and commandments of men, who turn away from the truth. So, he had to talk to men who were rebellious, empty talkers, and deceivers. Now, how would you like to be the man that was sent in to do that? He had to be a unique man, a man who knew exactly what he believed, and he was the test case at Jerusalem, and he had dealt with the problems of Corinthians, 
And then later on, I'm looking at 2 Timothy 4 and verse 10. Paul was in jail and uh, probably going to die. And it says here, verse 9, Make every effort to come to me soon, Timothy. For Demas has loved this pre present world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. And uh, Dalmatia is also called Illyricum. It's uh, modern day Yugoslavia and Albania in its area. And uh, these people were very warlike, very hard to subjugate. And uh, it was now a Roman province. Um, and so this was the type of people, Scythians lived in that area. Um, and so this was a very difficult people. So here was Timothy. He was sent to the Corinthian church that had all kinds of problems. He was a test case at Jerusalem. He was dealing with the rebellious empty talkers and Judaizers and deceivers there at the Isle of Crete. And he went into Dalmatia, a very difficult area also. And uh, so Titus did not placate his detractors. He was told to rebuke them sharply. Uh, why? So that they could be sound in the faith. Now this, uh, Titus would not receive the words given to the more retiring Timothy. Timothy was a uh, lower key, so perhaps. Um, he was um, softer in his appearance, I suppose, and how he came across to people. And uh, he, he was deferring, gentle. But uh, there are times when that almost worked against him because there had to be a very forthright thing or two said. And so Paul is writing to him. And he's sending Timothy uh, into uh, the Ephesian church, which also had some people who had tore it up. Paul had spent three years there at Ephesus. And now Timothy was being sent there to kind of correct things and reestablish leadership. And uh, these are the words that were said to Timothy. Until I come, give attention to public reading, um, scripture, to exhortation and teaching. Do not neglect the spiritual gift within you, which was bestowed on you through prophetic utterance with the laying on of hands by the presbytery. Take pains with these things, be absorbed in them, so that your progress will be evident to all. Pay close attention to yourself and to your teaching. Persevere in these things, for as you do this, you will ensure salvation both for yourself and those who hear you. And it says in verse 12, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example of those who believe. Now, when it says, do not look down on his purity, on his uh, youthfulness, uh, Timothy was not a teenager. Timothy was a man probably 40 years of age or more. And uh, so this is something sometimes that people will do. They'll look at a man who's 40 years of age and they'll say, well, he's not mature enough. He doesn't know life enough. And they'll look down on the man, and uh, he, he knows a lot more than they give him credit for. Uh, every once in a while, we have pastors who are unusually young-looking. And uh, the people sometimes give them a hard time thinking that they don't know uh, what they um, actually know. And uh, so I, I became a pastor at 27. Um, 
I was uh, mature, I suppose, for my age, but nevertheless, um, I wasn't old looking and I had some trouble. I had somebody tell me I was barely wet behind the ears and some other things, and maybe I deserve that. But nevertheless, uh, I had to act the part of a pastor, and I did know and pass the ordination exam, and it's very difficult in our fellowship, and that's quite an accomplishment. But at any rate, uh, there is a tendency by some, especially older individuals, to look down upon younger men who purport to preach the word. And Timothy was one of those men, and he was told that he had to buck up and uh, not be too retiring and deferring to those that were older than them. But I want you to know that wasn't words that were said, said to Titus. Uh, Titus just seemed to have a more forthright way in which he dealt with things. And uh, so it's interesting. Now, both Titus and Timothy are equally esteemed by Paul. In 1 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 2, don't turn there, it says, To Timothy, my true child in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. To Timothy, my true child in the faith. Then you come to Titus, and uh, these two books are written just about the same time. And he said in verse 4, To Titus, my true child, in a common faith, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Savior. Paul was very close to each one of these men. Paul had probably led each one of them to Christ. He saw himself as their spiritual father, and they had decided that they were going to follow along with Paul and be involved in his missionary journeys. And they put themselves at the disposal of uh, Paul. Paul saw himself as a bondservant. Timothy saw himself as a bondservant. Titus acted as a bond servant, although the words weren't particularly weren't especially said about him. But he could be sent into the difficult situations. He had that personality that just enabled him to go into some very rough problems and work through them. So in comparing uh, Timothy and Titus and what Paul said about them, uh, we should learn from this that Paul esteemed them equally, and we should learn from this that God's men can vary in personality and temperament. Well, Pastor, that seems patently obvious. Why are you saying that? Because people forget that. They forget that just because somebody isn't as dynamic as this pastor over here, or as evangelistic as that pastor there, that there's nothing wrong with this man. He has his way of going about things. As long as he's preaching the doctrine forthrightly, and he's sharing what the Bible has to say, he might be a little bit more retiring, and some other pastor you might have is a little more forthright. Um, but there is a difference. And every personality and temperament has its strengths, and weaknesses. And what you have to do is you have to maximize the impact of your strengths and compensate for your weaknesses. Uh, let me give you a couple examples. Let's say that a man is deeply empathetic or sympathetic. Uh, he just is a person that can come along with somebody weep with them, encourage them, feel their heart, and the people know that, man, pastor such and such really loves us. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. But you know what the weakness is? They can become overwhelmed by taking on everybody's burdens. And uh, so it can almost, the pastorate can just 
draw away every bit of strength of these men and they have to be careful they save a piece of themselves um, or you might have somebody that uh, can go in do a funeral they can just seem to handle everything just thus and such and keep their head and all kinds of things can swirl around them and they seem to be calm and clinical and uh, you know we want that in our doctors don't we we want them to hear our problems and then uh, they don't get overwhelmed by what our problems are and they can tell us let's try this let's try that and they work through these things but every once in a while maybe they're too clinical and one of the problems is that they might be a little insensitive or detached so you see there's that's like a coin with two different sides to it each one of them uh, maybe a pastor is academic and boy he can really get into the scriptures but on the other hand he's not very practical sometimes you have people that are all about being practical as pastors are very good at bringing the practicality out of this but sometimes these pastors have to be careful that they handle a passage thoroughly um, maybe somebody's very fervent very evangelistic you, you if you have had a very evangelistic fervent pastor and then you have one he, he evangelizes but he's not as fervent doesn't do as much since a lot of times he's compared to this person in an unfavorable fashion and he, i'm here to tell you um you've met you know probably some evangelistic men and uh, they don't come a dime a dozen and if you look at their gifts and a man who's a teacher uh, and you compare them there's considerable differences but they're both necessary in the body of christ so people forget people forget that god can highly esteem a man and call him into the ministry and i i've, I've met men that have been called into the ministry and they say i just about throw up every sunday that i have to preach um, they're so nervous about it uh, they don't like public speaking they'd rather be quiet then there are other men they glory in being up front doesn't bother them in the least but god has called all of these men into the ministry with their varying personalities he called 12 men to be his apostles and there was peter and he was just so, so forthright but he his personality had its weaknesses and then there were others that were very retiring and you didn't really hear a whole lot about them but nevertheless they were witnesses and so my friends just remember just as paul had esteemed very highly timothy and titus and they had different personalities and temperaments pastors do too uh, even at the church of Corinth, um, there, there were some people saying, well, I was baptized by um, Peter. I was baptized by Paul. Uh, I was baptized by uh, somebody else, Apollos. And they got to thinking that somehow or another <clears throat> that that made a difference who baptized them. No, it doesn't. You're all baptized in the name of Christ. And people get polarized around pastors and compare and my friends i'm just here to tell you although you can note the differences between men god called this man into the ministry and you have to work with him so uh the apostle paul gave sage advice uh in second corinthians second corinthians chapter 12 starting with verse 7. He said, Because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, for this reason to keep me from exalting myself, there was given me a thorn in the flesh. Huh? You never thought of it that way, Suppose I suppose. The problems that you have, physical problems, sometimes God gives them to you so they can do more through you. Because his strength seems to prevail more in our weaknesses 
So here is Paul. He was the writing prophet. He was the writing apostle. He wrote more than anybody else combined in the New Testament. And uh, God gave him a thorn in the flesh to ground him. It says, a messenger of Satan to torment me, to keep me from exalting myself. Concerning this, I implored the Lord three times that it might leave me. And he had said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for power is perfected in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, I will rather boast about my weaknesses, so that the power of Christ may dwell in me. Therefore, I am well content with weaknesses, with insults, with distresses, with persecutions, with difficulties, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then I am strong. And uh, so to flip, uh, uh, to flip everything on his head, if you think you have great preaching ability, or you think you have great empathy, or you know that you're very evangelistic, sometimes because you know those, and those are your strengths, you have to be careful because they might have actually be your weaknesses. You can say, I got this, God. I can deal with this. When in reality, when you preach, you need the power of God. When you evangelize, you need the Spirit of God working with you, uh, preparing that person's heart. You know, when you're empathetic, uh, you need the love of Christ spilling out of you. And so, uh, you know, you don't really do anything in your own strength. Um, so Titus, Titus had a common belief system here. He said, uh, my true child, Titus chapter 1, verse 4, in a common faith, common faith. He said to Timothy, my child in the faith, that this is in a common faith. I think they basically mean the same thing. But they have a belief system that is identical with the Apostle Paul. Uh, Titus would not preach works salvation. It says here, grace and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. Titus understood perfectly the gospel and what saved you, and it wasn't your works. It was the grace of God by activated by exercising faith. And uh, so, for this reason, he understood what the gospel was. Titus would not preach peace with God, could be had in many different ways. He'd preach only one way. He would know that there was one God and one mediator, between God and man, which is what Paul said in 1 Timothy uh, chapter 2 and verse 5. He would remember that Jesus Christ said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He would remember what Paul uh, had Luke write down in the book of Acts. And there is salvation and no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. And so he knew that there was only one way to be saved, only one way to get to heaven. Uh, for this reason, it says in verse 5, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. Because you are my common, you are my child in the common faith. Because uh, grace and peace uh, from our Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior, uh, because of our relationship and I, my knowing who you are and what you've been doing with me all along. And for this reason, I left you in Crete to do this particular job. And, uh, you know, uh, for this reason is a very powerful statement. Um, Titus knew what he had to do and this letter reiterates it right here and there was another man that Paul uh, God had sent not Paul and uh, we find this in uh, Matthew chapter 11 and it's what Jesus said about John the Baptist 
As these men were going away, they were men that were saying, are you the Christ? And uh, John the Baptist wants to know. And he said, go back to him and tell him, uh, report to him, the blind receive sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have the gospel preached to them. And so they went back to tell John this. And then Jesus says some things. Verse 7. As these men were going away, Jesus began to speak to the crowd about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind? Some little flimsy plant? No. But what did you go out to see? A man dressed in soft clothing? You know, some effeminate gook? Those who wear soft clothing are in king's palaces. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and one who is more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, Behold, I send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I say to you, among these those born of women, there has not arisen anyone greater than John the Baptist, yet the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. So, you know, John, he preached fearlessly. Uh, he did what was on his plate. He ended up getting his head chopped off. And, you know, we need men who have an inner strength that will stand for the truth, even though they might get their head chopped off. They're not afraid of men. Just as John the Baptist was not afraid of the king and told him what he needed to hear, and we're coming to an age when men will fear people more than they fear God. Um, Paul was writing to Timothy, which is a letter that was written after Titus, and it was after he had been captured again and been imprisoned. And Paul was going to die. And he says here in 2 Timothy 4, starting with verse 2, Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will endure, not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance to their own desires, and will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. Well, friends, that's the type of pastor that you want. And you don't want to be the type of people that will get rid of a pastor who's preaching the truth to get somebody in here that'll lie to you. We have enough people who are preaching just to tickle the ears of the people that are coming in to hear. And so, my friends, seek a man who preaches the word and do not be people that will persecute a pastor who does. God's blessing upon you.